My name is MB Delocchio and I'm a London-based Samuro artist, author, and social worker who specializes in artistic psychosocial rehabilitation. I served as a medic, mental health sergeant, and retention NCO in the U.S. Army for eight years and while on deployment to Ramadi, Iraq in 2004 to 2005. I served as a member of Team Lioness, the first female team that was attached to Marine Infantry units to perform checkpoint operations, house raids, and personnel searches on Iraqi women and children for weapons and explosives. Before becoming a social worker, I was an artist who found creating art as a way to navigate the world around me. I currently run workshops and educational events surrounding veterans and creative methods of dealing with trauma, as well as produce for a veteran art studio here on YouTube. I'm in the process of building out an online art academy in addition to other related courses, but today we're going to focus on transforming trauma into inspiration, and I'll be sharing with you some of my own experiences and how I discovered creative ways to express and process painful memories. Today we're going to cover a brief introduction to using art to transform trauma into inspiration and the difference between art therapy and artistic psychosocial rehabilitation. I'll share with you a piece of my own journey as well as the creative process itself. Then we'll move into the hero's journey, creatively expressing trauma and the importance of developing narratives. Finally, we'll discuss creating while marginalized, unblocking creativity, and a bit more how you can participate via Better in Art Studio. Now, when it comes to expressing life experiences, whether through creative writing, painting, music, or performance art, art has the power to alleviate what many of us might have been taught to suppress or numb out. Instead, I invite survivors to transform trauma into inspiration. According to the American Art Therapy Association, arts-based interventions from the visual arts to music can be used to reduce PTSD symptoms and coexisting conditions, improve cognitive functioning and behavior, aid in the expression of traumatic events and addressing recurring episodes, bolster self-esteem, and providing stress reduction. When it comes to creating music, the effects are of course similar. Music-based therapeutic interventions have demonstrated the ability to facilitate the expression of traumatic memories, resilience building, motivation for long-term success, and lowering the need to seek additional mental health services. For those of you who know me, you might have heard me use the term artistic psychosocial rehabilitation in relation to what I do as a licensed social worker, but there's a reason why. Art therapy and what I do are two different paths where art and mental health intersect but can often coexist within the same practices or facilities. For example, when I was working for a nonprofit organization in Arizona that provided art therapy for children and adults, um, the children's program was facilitated by art therapists. On the adult side of the house, we had a team of people with varied mental health backgrounds who also happened to be professional artists. Some were peer support, some were social workers, and what we conducted was artistic psychosocial rehabilitation. That's where I officially had my beginnings of intersecting art and mental health as a career, which has since moved into my practice as a macro social worker. This organization had daily symptom management and skills building through the arts in the mornings and art space, career and professional development in the afternoons, which included how to approach art galleries, mock job interviews, resume slash CV writing, website building, art portfolio development, and much more. The two are separate academic and licensing paths, and art therapy is specifically facilitated by a licensed art therapist who effectively supports personal and relational treatment goals, as well as community concerns. So for the rest of this presentation, what you're going to be seeing is the artistic psychosocial rehabilitation side of social work and how to apply a variety of creative methods to turning trauma into inspiration. Artistic psychosocial rehabilitation is a holistic, recovery-oriented approach to mental health treatment that incorporates artistic expression as part of a therapeutic program. Art, music, photography, theater, and more can be effective mediums for communicating struggles with anger management, interpersonal relationships, anxiety, depression, addiction, and trauma. It can also offer veterans the ability to explore their thoughts, feelings, and perspectives of the world through a variety of creative mediums. 
So to share a bit about my story, um, during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, I relocated to London from Los Angeles and created Veteran Art Studio here on YouTube, which embodies all intersectional aspects of my experiences, what the journey has meant to date, and why it's important to broaden one's horizons on the path to healing from military and war-based trauma. In a time of crisis, it became a priority to let people know that they weren't alone and that healing is certainly possible. I would argue that it is imperative to include the arts in evidence-based interventions. However, my own journey of dealing with trauma and self-isolating began in late 2005 when I returned from Iraq. Much like other trauma survivors, hypervigilance, anger, depression, and a variety of trauma-induced symptoms can take its toll on the psyche, and I found myself running on fumes for years in my own post-war community reintegration process. The purpose of using an artistic or creative outlet to express emotion is not only to document aspects of one's life or pain, but to make it tangible and to gain perspective. When we're given the space to breathe, create, and hear or see our work with before our eyes, the results are a sense of empowerment and the gift of seeing or hearing our experience in present tangible form. In turn, the artist or creator owns those thoughts and memories. They don't own the artist. However, art didn't return to me as naturally as I would have liked. And to explain why, allow me to frame what I was working against. After a traumatic deployment and then a horrific divorce in 2009 that left me stranded in central Massachusetts, I made a solemn vow to live my life for me and no one else. After a workshop in Arizona that allowed me to briefly escape the bitter winter weather of New England, I decided to move to Phoenix in 2010 to start anew. Knowing no one in Arizona meant that I would have to start with a new canvas in life, and I would select the colors for a happier, brighter chapter, much like the jaw-dropping, beautiful Arizona sunset. The Arizona State Women Veterans Coordinator at the time, Gabe Forsberg, reached out to me and helped me secure a position in Phoenix. A few weeks later, I packed my clothes and books into my tiny Kia Spectra, gave all my other belongings away in furniture, and got on the road to the rest of my life. From Massachusetts to Arizona, this road trip changed my life and opened my eyes to the beauty of the picturesque, picturesque American West, um, the dramatic colors, the craggy purple mountains kissed by turquoise and orange skies, enveloped me and urged me to get back to painting ASAP. Upon my arrival, Gabe welcomed me with open arms and introduced me to an arts group after catching sight of some of my drawings that I carried around in my notebook. The arts group, Los Veteranos de Arizona, was led by a Vietnam veteran named Jim Covarrubias of Aristlan Studios in downtown Phoenix. It was comprised of predominantly male and Latino combat veterans of the Vietnam War era. At first, I was a bit apprehensive about joining any veterans group. After all, so many white male dominated veterans groups and nonprofits basically scoffed at and marginalized veterans like me. Gabe interviewed, or intervened rather, and talked with Jim in hopes of getting a positive response and proving my pessimism wrong. Gabe suggested I give them another chance, saying that she understood my skepticism, yet that they wanted to tell me that uh, they wanted to welcome artists like me because while they don't know what it's like to walk in my boots as a woman, they knew what it was like to come home and have your military service shamed or ignored, and how lonely it can be, especially due to the color of your skin. That was probably the best response I've ever heard from a predominantly male group in regard to women veterans. Los Veteranos were original, sincere, and best of all, they were amazing artists too. So they were incredibly supportive to the point that they convinced me to show my work for a Veterans Day exhibit in 2010 and show art which represented memories that I had held onto for years in a public setting. No pissing contest of who did what and when, that you often see with your average veterans group. While other Iraq and Afghanistan veterans groups snubbed me for years to maintain their boys club status quo, this Vietnam veterans group took me in. They just allowed me to be me and didn't judge me, and really that's all I've ever wanted. Upon entry into the art show, Jim proposed a challenge to all artists. We weren't expected to make safe art, which meant that we were challenged to do more than just draw or paint bald eagles, American flags, or any other predictable patriotic symbols. No, Jim wanted us to artistically address the memories that bothered us most in addition to parts of our heritage that helped us survive. Taking the challenge seriously, I drew the memories that haunted me the most, the faces of children in the midst of war. 
It wasn't whirring helicopter blades, rocket propelled grenades, bloodied corpses, or IEDs that kept me awake through the early morning hours. It was the petrified expressions of children, even their joyous expressions while standing in rubble playing with trash like surrogate toys that haunted me. So I drew and painted them. I lost days of sleep as I finished the works of art. I cried every night. I looked at photos of Ramadi filled with remorse and guilt that I could have done more to help or save lives. However, upon completion, something strange happened. I started to feel lighter. I, it felt like I had taken off a layer of armor, psychological Kevlar that weighed me down. Those memories of children's suffering were now on paper, validated, and no longer owned me. I owned these memories and had control of them now. In accepting Jim's challenge, I arranged my traumatic thoughts like artwork in a portfolio. Shortly after these therapeutic art shows, I took a position in Tucson at a place called Art Awakenings as an artistic behavioral health specialist. They were specifically recruiting artists who had a mental health background and training and certification, so this sounded like a dream job. At work in the Art Awakening studio, I felt fortunate to be in a position to work in both mental health and fine arts. This combination of the two made sense to me. I watched as my clients painted, chiseled, and created, some simply to avoid crying or breaking down. Some of them in a zen-like state, just happy. Then one day a client started a conversation with me that I'll never forget. You must feel great about not being one of us and being an instructor, she said, with what appeared to be a smile covering shame. I responded, the line that seemingly separates you and I in this place is very thin. You could easily be wearing my badge and I your client file. I am no better and you are no worse. It's a matter of regaining control of one's life and if I didn't believe in any of you and your ability to move on well beyond my means, I wouldn't be here. She laughed and said, well, when you put it like that, I sound like less of a patient and quite possibly normal. My response was, you are normal. What happened to you wasn't and you're responding accordingly. We all have to find ways to not let trauma or illness define us as people. She led me to a painting that she was working on throughout the week saying, look at this, Michelle. Can you really call what I do fine art? I don't know all the rules of art. After being pushed out or rejected from art shows, galleries, and spaces for years before moving to Arizona, it occurred to me that sometimes these so-called rules serve as unnecessary barriers to creativity. I told her, Fine art is a discipline of breaking rules. Pay no attention to those artists that you learn from in school. You have to find your own way through art as through trauma and uncover your own personal truth and authentic voice. That's where you uncover the beauty that has been within you all along. She smiled and returned to her project. But in helping others processing their pain through art like I did, I realized how important it was to tie two big parts of my life that had seemed so far apart together. In turn, I completed my MSW at USC and have been helping others develop their artistic narratives ever since. Veterans who are trauma survivors searching for a recovery method that fits them best may be viewed as warriors embarking on what Joseph Campbell described as the hero's journey. Those experiencing post-traumatic stress not only have to navigate mental health stigma, but find their path toward healing while managing various forms of trauma-induced symptoms. As a combat veteran artist and social worker, assisting others on their hero's journey was only possible because I had figured it out the hard way. I discussed the post-war homecoming odyssey in my memoir, The Desert Warrior. But this alternative perspective of arts-based interventions for trauma symptom management and healing calls for an examination of strengths present within the veteran community and trauma survivors, requiring a reframing of their symptomology. Using the arts, visual, literary, music, performance, etc., as coping strategies and managing the aftermath of traumatic circumstances effectively serve as tools for learning to manage traumatic memories with a creative lens. Using the hero's journey, a service member or veteran's experience could be facilitated by understanding the creative process. This process can be done alone or with the guidance of a therapist. For example, one could choose to write using first-person perspective or use the voice of a third person to narrate the story of the protagonist, or plan out a painting using the hero's journey template as a source to draw from to create various elements, moods, or symbols within a piece. 
Before embarking upon the hero's journey, it's highly recommended to ease oneself into the creative process by creating a specific space to brainstorm. One can compose music, create visual art, or even choreograph a performance piece using the creative process to begin using the creative lens to produce works in one's chosen medium. The following process is outlined here, where one could use it alone or to assist a client. One, find your favorite place, time to create. Figure out where you feel the most comfortable to work on your chosen creative project. It could be a specific area of your home, outdoors, or even in bed using paper and pen or an app. Whenever you feel the most inspired to create, go with it and make it your creative spot. Two, choose your favorite methods to create. Whether you prefer using paper and pen, apps in your phone, voice to text, or a combination of variety of methods, figure out what works best for you. Three, turn off your inner critic. This is so important. <laughs> so you don't have to be a published author or hold a master of fine arts to get started, but you should do your best to silence your inner critic. It's important to note that you shouldn't get too bogged down in mastering the technical details of any medium or given craft. One can always adjust and correct later. Even the most experienced artists make mistakes, so allow yourself room for errors as well. The most important thing is that you're here and that you're expressing yourself. Four, figure out what you want to express most. Do you want to write about traumatic events? Do you want to paint a period that took place during childhood or adulthood, or even a combination of both? Decide what period you want to focus on. Five, outline your project. This is where you can start to organize a creative project by plugging in dates and locations of your story or periods of time that inspire creative expression. Six, select a chapter or section that excites you the most and get to creating. Choose a specific event or details of your story that's calling your name and just go with it. This can be used in writing poetry, a memoir, fiction, music, or even to organize your thoughts for performance or visual art. Seven, keep a notes app on your phone or a notebook for sudden bursts of inspiration. No matter what you like to use for planning creative projects, keep your preferred method for taking quick notes close. I prefer using both a notes app on my phone as well as a moleskin notebook for random thoughts and unexpected moments of inspiration that I don't want to forget. You'd be surprised how and when the muse strikes. So resist the urge to tell yourself, I'll remember this later because inspiration comes and goes and can be easily forgotten. Author Joseph Campbell introduced the concept of the hero's journey as a universal theme of going on a journey that includes a transformation. This journey is not only present in mythological tales and religious studies, but it's well known in works such as Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and numerous other books and films. The book was intended to help people see myth as a reflection of the sublime adventure of life and then to breathe new life into it. The challenging process of military-related trauma rehabilitation and community reintegration parallels Campbell's metaphorical use via literary arts of the stages of departure, initiation, and return. This historical conceptual framework for understanding psychosocial and lingering impacts of trauma not only explains the odyssey of the veteran experience, but that the path from trauma toward healing is a worthwhile journey that emerges from the creative process. The hero's journey may be used as a method for the writing process, but it's imperative to emphasize that this approach is not limited to this medium. While narratives of trauma, military service, or even childhood could vary, it's important to choose a specific range of time to focus on for a creative project. By selecting a specific period of time, one can concentrate on events, details, and themes that are linear and limited. In doing so, this minimizes distractions, tangents, while giving the project its core. Now, here with the Hero's Journey chart, I go into detail with this uh, specific piece on my YouTube channel in the episode called Writing Down Trauma, but you could use this as a cheat sheet for outlining your narrative, which is also posted in my blog. But for the sake of time, I can't go into each one of these in this session, but I do in detail on my channel if you're looking to invest time in crafting your narrative or helping someone craft theirs. When it comes to creatively expressing trauma, Dr. James Pennebaker, who studied expressive writing, said by writing, you put some structure and organization to those anxious feelings and that it helps you get past them. Other research by Dr. Pennebaker indicates that suppressing negative trauma-related thoughts compromises immune functioning and that those who write visit the doctor less often. 
There is something undoubtedly special about putting one's own thoughts and memories into a creative project. When we express what disturbs us most, what we fear, or things that we're afraid to talk about, we free up space in our minds for something positive and healthier to take up that space. If we become unafraid of the voices within, it is also easier to lose our fear of the voices of those around us. In the book, Writing Down the Bones, Freeing the Writer Within, Natalie Goldberg states, I don't think everyone wants to create the great American novel, but we all have a dream of telling our stories, of realizing what we think, feel, and see before we die. Writing is a path to meet ourselves and become intimate. In my Veteran Art Studio episode of Expressive Writing, I go into this process a bit more in detail if you're interested. Art is an extremely powerful tool to convey a narrative that can be used for a variety of purposes. It can also play a significant role in not only creating meaningful work, but to communicate parts of us that need to come out from expressing trauma to a sense of injustice. Much like storytelling, various art forms are more than just entertainment. It's an opportunity to influence the way people think about issues through various lenses, such as race and ethnicity, mental health, gender, class, and more. This approach in artistic storytelling, we can engage with others and ensure members of marginalized communities have the ability to share their voices via different mediums, and in doing so, we may be better informed of their daily struggles, triumphs, and everything in between. Using one's narrative can be a helpful tool to bring about awareness or to promote social change because of its ability to convey messages in a creative way that can easily be spread throughout the world through social media to sharing one's work in public spaces. Narratives are much like a blueprint for transforming trauma into inspiration because it provides an organic piece that is unique and personal to the artist. In turn, there's a constant source to pull from for ideas, inspiration, or looking at trauma through different periods of time or new angles. For example, when I wrote my memoir, The Desert Warrior, it covered my deployment to Iraq starting from late 2004 all the way through 2013, documenting different aspects of my journey in a timeline of events. I had also used Joseph Campbell's hero's journey to outline my story, organize my thoughts, and keep me focused on important aspects I needed to include. From the Prague chapter of my book, I've created my current virtual exhibit, Coffee with Kafka, to communicate loss, depression, and isolation. From my time in Iraq, I've created additional black and white pieces in addition to graphic pieces that illustrate various forms of pain and trauma from combat. And of course, a lot of my inspiration came back to me in the desert while living in Arizona, so I have a collection of works depicting the Southwest as a spiritually transformative experience. In crafting the narrative, we should consider one timeline. Using the hero's journey, complete the key points, even if in bullet form, to organize your thoughts. Challenges, what are the obstacles that exist in your narrative? What are the perceived vulnerabilities? What are some of the unique challenges faced in the timeline? Then you wanna consider your allies. Who are your allies or protagonists of this narrative? How did they impact your journey? Threats, what are the perceived threats of the narrative? or in the narrative, who or what try to stop you from moving forward. Next, we have pathos. What could you incorporate into the narrative that may evoke strong emotion um, from your intended audience? And finally, ethos. How does the narrative align with your ethical and moral beliefs? Once you've completed these points, you can consider a variety of ways to artistically implement your narrative as well as your preferred medium. Next, I want to talk about creating while marginalized. Now, there are people out there who need your art, music, or any other creative works you produce. When you put your art into the world, you are literally contributing to art history just by existing. If you belong to a marginalized community, you are not just creating for yourself anymore. And when it comes to literary arts, visual arts, the music industry, and more, the bigotry and obstructionism sure exists and can sometimes compound your experience as an artist, something in which I can certainly relate. There are so many marginalized people throughout history of various art mediums, uh, literature, who've attempted to just go around unjust organizations and institutions by concealing their identities or essentially building their own table. Let's say you're an artist who wants to fight against the broken system. You want to push back against bigotry and marginalization. 
You want to find a way to break into the industry, but you might often find that the primary decision makers who determine whether your career happens or not are people who not only don't understand your identity, but may not even really believe that an audience exists for your demographic. Or even worse, they don't want your art scene heard or experienced at all due to prejudice. To this I say, self-publish if you need to. Set up your own art shop or virtual exhibit. Create a short film that you've always wanted to make. Write that play or TV script. Act as though you're always going to get a yes no matter how many times you've heard no, and someone, somewhere, will fall in love with your work because you've invested time, passion, and energy in being authentically you despite the odds and obstacles. And that's a beautiful thing. Now, I'm not gonna say that it's easy to push aside demoralizing moments and all those feelings are undoubtedly valid and real. You're going to get tired of fighting at various points in your life and you'll need to reset and recharge from negative situations. When you find yourself feeling exhausted, do your best to give yourself a bit of self-compassion. At the end of the day, your struggle and your sacrifice through art can help make someone else's life that much easier and provide a relatable vision and voice when someone is feeling alone in the world and just by striving to be your best and most creative self, others will be inspired to do it too. And as a community, we can lift one another up that way. Unblocking creativity is something that um, came up a lot <laughs> throughout my career and as discussed through crafting your narrative and the hero's journey, my own story serves as a source of inspiration when I'm feeling a creative block. So if I want to go into a new direction that has nothing to do with a specific event in my narrative, I go through these five steps in order to work through it. So step one, choose a mood. You don't have to have the end result of your project figured out just yet. So take the stress out of the equation for a moment by focusing on your feelings, what you want to express. It could be happiness, anger, sadness, anxiety, any emotion or experience that you want to explore but may not know how to just yet. Step two, choose at least one color you can associate with the mood in step one. For example, if I wanted to convey sadness, I think of a deep blue and varying shades of it. Step three, choose symbols that you can associate with color and or mood. So continuing with sadness and shades of blue, I could associate water, justice and tranquility with blue, even if I just associate it now with sadness. You don't have to relate the color and the mood constantly. You can define your symbol separately, which will help you think about how it all could be tied together later. Sadness I could associate with being alone in an empty room, an overcast sky, time feeling longer than it is, or a general feeling of coldness. Step four, what do all of these items convey? Sit with your word, color, and mood associations. For example, what is sadness having to do with shades of blue, a cold room? Step five, assemble at least three aspects into your project. In the end, I could paint a picture of someone or myself sitting in an empty room, dimmed with shades of blue, with a small window revealing an overcast gray sky outside. Next to the subject could be an old-fashioned alarm clock indicating that time is standing still in a painful way, allowing for the persistence of sadness or depression. Here's an example of this creative unblocking flow as it pertains to a piece I created a decade ago called Women Warriors in the Pinup. I started with the emotion or mood of anger, then associated red, yellow, and camouflage with it. I wasn't sure what I was going to do in the beginning, but I did know what I wanted to express on the most primal level. Next, I explored my own feelings of anger, moments where I felt it the most, and it pertained to the veteran experience as well as what I went through in Iraq, but I wanted to narrow one aspect aspect of it down and focus on it. It made sense that I chose red and camouflage, but yellow was symbolic of an accompanying anxiety that is related to the anger. The aspect that I chose next uh, was the anger I felt as a woman veteran and how isolating it can feel in the homecoming process. I then collected related materials pertaining to the colors and organized them into a folder and on Pinterest to create somewhat of a mood board of where I wanted to go. As you can see here, um, in the actual painting, which is acrylic on canvas and now up at the Pacific Island Ethnic Art Museum in Long Beach, California, I conveyed the anger uh, through a scene of a former battle buddy and I in Ramadi, Iraq. But here is the visual indignation while seeing a sexualized pinup poster that reads, We support our boys. This wasn't a specific poster like this in Iraq, but 
there have been plenty of examples where women and women veterans are made to look like they are fragile, delicate flowers waiting to be picked or exploited. And I wanted to express how infuriating it is to be continually misunderstood and pushed to the margins by protastic veterans groups, bigots, and otherwise ignorant people. In painting this, I didn't need to say anything else, and the responses I've received from praise to grimaces from angry vet bros made it worth the time I've spent creating it. So when making art, speak your truth. You'll be surprised to find many other people feel the same way and may have had difficulty expressing it, or you may make someone super narrow-minded think, which is a gift that you give to them and yourself. In the end, creativity makes life worth living. One of the most worthwhile aspects in the journey of expressing trauma through the arts is that we get to know ourselves that much better. Our voice and creative lens are important, not only to ourselves, but to the collective story and tapestry of humanity. It's easy to take that for granted. When we allow ourselves to speak from the heart and mind, we release a purifying fire onto the blank spaces before us. When we transmute trauma into inspiration, it's somewhat of a magical process, much like the hero's journey itself. Our perceptions change when we revisit past events, after we've changed, grown a bit older, and hopefully wiser. But more importantly, they allow us to see memories in tangible form and provide space for reflection. By reflecting, we give ourselves both space and permission to let go of what has been hurting us or haunting us, and more importantly, we give ourselves the space to heal. In creating works that emanate from difficult experiences, we create something new that allows us to follow our bliss toward a path of healing, redemption, and purpose. With that said, I encourage you, if you're comfortable, to share your works of art with the hashtags of the Art of War or hashtag Art of War and hashtag Veteran Art Studio on Instagram. And you're also more than welcome to tag me at MB Delocchio. And another big thanks to Minority Veterans of America for hosting this year's amazing summit and be sure to check out their future events and how you can participate. You can also find more tutorials and guides on my YouTube channel, MB Delocchio, and the arts playlist from Veteran Art Studio to my writing workshops. For more information, you can reach out to me at mbdelocchio.com and my blog, arrivalsdeparturs.uk. Here's my contact information if you'd like to reach out, and I look forward to seeing your progress, work, and all your amazing wins on your creative journey.